Come on, Lily. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I know. I'm such a good dog owner. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. It's been raining cats and dogs. Am I allowed to say that, Lily? It's been raining cats but not dogs for the last three days. And uh, so this morning I was out uh, with Lily. She doesn't like the rain, so I had to have the umbrella over her. And I was out in the rain, and as people drove by, they were going like, are you crazy? And I'm going, well, that's Lily. You know, what are you going to do? It's not my fault. Anyway, it's crazy weather here. So lots going on. Uh, my sister, uh, Janet, she's all over me because, you know, now that the, the WHO has said uh, we're end of the global health emergency, she's going like, well, who's going to tell me what to do? And I said to her, well, no, no problem, you got me. So we still, we're still at it, Janet, don't worry, don't worry about a thing. So as you know, lots of stuff going on in the news. The World Health Organization declared the end to the global health emergency. It's now been three years, if you think about that. You know, if you think about the flu pandemic in 1918, it lasted for two years, maybe two and a half. This was three years. Uh, it, the WHO, of course, emphasized that COVID's not gone. The, duh. Of course it's not gone. It's all over the place, but it's just that the healthcare emergency is over. And, you know, I can understand that. Um, there's a lot of things that the WHO has to keep doing that can't just totally focus on COVID. But same thing with the CDC. The CDC uh, said that they're no longer going to be reporting a lot of the case data. I've been saying this for weeks. The case data is unreliable anyway. But they are going to continue to monitor the number of deaths and also the number of hospitalizations. And, of course, the only way to really monitor things is really through the wastewater. So the end of a pandemic is not much different from the beginning of a pandemic because we're now no longer getting data from states, from counties, from agencies around case number. And we're really having to use surrogate markers. The only good thing is now at the end, we've learned a lot of that wastewater is a good indicator. And so that's a good means for surveillance. So we're going to need to keep doing this because we may still have another mutation that will bring a surge in the winter, you never know, uh, but we'll be following that with you uh, as well. One other important new change, uh, it's since we're in the news of medicine, uh, new guidelines for mammograms, a shout out to the U.S. Preventive Service who announced last week that they plan to lower the breast cancer screening recommendation to age 40 for women at average risk. This is an important change, so in the past it's been 50 and over, so 40 and over is a big change, so <laughs> probably women out there. Uh, make sure you're being followed and, and uh, getting your screening. Uh, my favorite thing in the news, of course, was that the CDC had a conference on COVID and it held a three-day conference in Atlanta. And, um, you know, it was the first time they've been together in over three years. 2,000 people attended. Many didn't wear masks because, you know, it's the end. And 35 people tested positive at the CDC conference. So, you know... It's a lot of virus out there, and you get a bunch of people together, and you're going to get infected. The other uh, new thing in the in the news was, of course, we've been I've been telling you all the different animals that get infected. You know, minks and hamsters and all that stuff. Uh, White-tailed deer in the in uh, most of the U.S. and Canada. One hunter harvested a mule deer from El Dorado County, so this is the first time mule deers have been shown to be infected. Uh, didn't have any out. Uh, didn't have any evidence of disease and. They just had tested for some reason, but that's the first evidence in California of uh, a deer uh, reservoir, or at least a deer getting infected. So I had a couple of questions that were left over from the last Q&A that I didn't answer, and I did want to answer because uh, a couple of people wrote me about um, whether or not there were symptoms in the eyes. So one person got COVID and had particular uh, conjunctivitis, I wanted to know if that was fairly common. So there has been a, a meta-analysis. That's a, taking a bunch of different studies uh, using the ones that, in, or, that you think are important to include based on certain criteria and then adding up all the data. So this was, a, this was there was a meta-analysis done that included studies that had, uh, that actually reported ocular manifestations and also had data for R, uh, reverse, the RT-PCR, PCR in, um, in ocular fluid. So there were a total of 30 studies, 5,700 patients, and there were eye complications, not in a lot, but around six or seven percent. So conjunctivitis was in seven percent, uh, discharge in about 4.85 percent, excess watering of the eyes in about seven percent, and the sensation of a foreign body. 
Uh, so, and when they did the swabs and, and did the fluid, uh, in 4% of the cases, you could actually detect virus in the ocular fluid, which is important because, you know, if we all get this, we rub our eyes, we touch things. That's a good way to, we, we talk about washing hands. Well, if you rub your eyes and you're infected and you shake hands with someone, that's a good way to transmit. So, uh, it, it just shows you that it's, while it's a low complication, it does occur. And there was also a report from L.A. County that they reported 30 percent they had a conjunctivitis recently with XBB, the most recent variant. Whether that's really, uh, you know, it's not a big study, so I don't, I don't know. Historically, they had been reporting the same numbers these other groups had reported, somewhere around 3 or 4 percent. So 30 percent seemed pretty high, but they just offered up the potential of maybe XBB seems to be more involved with the upper airway and the eyes. Anyway, that, that was uh, one question. Got another question this past week uh, about a flight. That they're planning on traveling with a three and a half month old. Uh, and, you know, we're worried because I'd said about the COVID being positive on airplanes. Of course, those were international flights. But uh, so, the, you know, the, the, um, it, it's, a good, it's a good question. If you think about it, when newborns are born, they have a passive immunity from the mother. And that immunity lasts for up to around six months. Uh, and the other thing is young kids have not had a uh, very serious illness. So a three and a half month old, you know, I think would probably be okay traveling. Uh, but uh, like always, as I've suggested, when you travel, I would always take some test kits just in case. And I take some packs of it along in case you need it for the adults. Uh, I had another question of a friend had just infected with COVID. I assume an XBB variant. He wants to get another bivalent soon, maybe in two to three week interval. And he dated, how do you think that's safe? And, and I've gotten this question from my sister's friends a lot. Uh, you know, if you're recently infected with XBB, you don't need to get a booster right away. In fact, I would hold off for, I would hold off till the fall. Uh, no reason to get one two to three weeks after. In fact, the recommendation is more like six weeks to two months. But frankly, I, you'll, you should be protected for four to six months from the current strain. So I would not do anything until the fall. And then we'll talk about, you know, we'll be following this to see whether or not what we, what we recommend in the fall. Uh, one person wanted to know if COVID remained this past year one of the leading causes of death. And uh, you may remember we talked about the mortality of COVID and it was the third leading cause of death in 2021. 20, uh, Last year, it dropped to fourth leading cause of death, uh, uh, so only superseded by heart disease and cancer. And of course, the third cause of death that jumped ahead of COVID was uh, basically unintentional injuries that include uh, drug overdoses, car accidents, and gun-related injuries. So I, I got a lot of questions about how does, is it possible that we, you know, should be developing new, uh, new antivirals and new drugs and what have we learned from the pandemic? And, you know, one thing we know is that uh, currently, you know, the mRNA vaccines, while they were very quick to, uh, to be manufactured, they tend to be unstable. They have to be stored at very low temperatures. We now know, three years later, that the durability of the immunity is not that long. It lasts about six uh, months. We also know that they don't elicit much of an IgA response in the nose or upper airway, and so it doesn't prevent you from getting infected. It prevents you from getting really sick and dying, uh, but it's, it doesn't prevent the uh, upper airways from getting infected. And we also know, after three years, that we haven't had a lot of antiviral drugs. I mean, we just, it, it's been kind of disappointing. So if you imagine what should we be thinking uh, for the future, uh, not only this pan pandemic, but in future pandemics, we need to have a, a vaccine that's much more broadly neutralizing, clearly one that's cheaper to make if we're going to vaccinate the whole world, one that's more stable, has longer durability, and we also need to start developing effective drugs. So there was one really interesting study in Nature uh, looking at whether uh, artificial intelligence could be used to design better vaccines. And I, I thought this was a, you know, a really interesting study because so many people ask me, well, you know, what's the impact of AI in medicine? And we really don't know. I mean, there's opportunities for language processing and helping physicians, but how about in science and drug design? So this was a really interesting paper that took uh, the antigen, the, the vac the, basically the, the spike protein. And if you look at the sequence of it in red you can see there are lots of different loops and the, the virus itself if you look at it it's it, it's it loops around it's not just a line 
there's a lot of third uh, tertiary structure to it. So they, they ran it through an uh, artificial intelligence program that was designed to maximize rigidity. So it just each it would just substitute every amino acid possible until it got to more and more rigid structure and then keep going. And so it took this sequence that has a lot of loops in it and created a very rigid structure. Uh, and they took that sequence and uh, used it as an immunogen, just like a, you know, a vaccine. And what they found, at least in mice, was that the antibody response was 128-fold greater. So hugely more immunogenic uh, than uh, the original just taking the vaccine and letting it, the, the uh, spike protein, let it fold naturally, making this rigid structure. And it also was stable uh, at least six-fold longer uh, at room temperature. So this study makes me think that uh, some of the artificial intelligence that we might be able to use to help improve vaccine design uh, is on the horizon, which is pretty exciting. There was another machine language type uh, study looking for drugs. I mentioned that we didn't have enough drugs. And so what this group did was take a very large data set uh, the, of uh, RNA sequences and a lot of bulk uh, uh, protein data and just scan it for potential targets uh, and they use it, you know, added all the data for all the, the, the viral components and just looked, are there potential targets uh, that could be druggable and then looked at all the potential drugs that could be used and they identified literally hundreds of drugs that, that could be tried uh, as antivirals in the future. So that was also an exciting use of big data sets to try and find potential uh, drugs and tr druggable targets. And then finally, uh, just in, in the new strategies for treatment, AstraZeneca has uh, used, uh, has come up with a monoclonal antibody, again, uh, that might be effective for all the variants. As you know, each of the monoclonals were only effective for a particular variant. Once there was a mutation, the monoclonal didn't work. Uh, AstraZeneca took B cells, which are the cells that make antibodies from a bunch of different patients who'd been infected and found uh, an, an antibody that was very effective at, at broadly neutralizing. This is reminiscent of the work that I've talked about with Bart Haynes, taking B cells out, uh, looking at what the antibody that's broadly neutralizing, and then reverse engineering it to figure out where's the domain that it recognized, and then using that antigen as a potential uh, uh, vaccine target. And then finally, again, in new developments in vaccines, uh, there's a bivalent nasal vaccine now uh, that's been uh, studied. And so this is another potential that we're hoping that could be uh, uh, used to generate a, a bigger, a better IgA response and might eventually prevent infectivity. So lots of interesting studies, uh, lots of uh, stuff going on that will help us in the current pandemic and hopefully in future pandemics. So uh, again, lots of science that's gonna be really important. I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, to Kara Marshall. She's an assistant professor of neuroscience and a McNair scholar. She has been named the Freeman Rabowski Scholar by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So she's among 31 scientists from across the country who's recognized for outstanding early career development. And her research is really fascinating. She gave a talk yesterday on how the brain uh, senses mechanical sensor uh, forces within the body. So how do you know when you're full? How do you know when you have to go to the bathroom? Things like that. So very interesting. I uh, also want to congratulate Dr. Eric Warren, who's the chair of the Department of Radiology. He's been elected to the Board of Chancellors of the American College of Radiology and the chair of the Commission on Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. Really terrific uh, recognition of, of his uh, scholarship. And then I'd also like to congratulate Dr. Jeff Rosen, a professor in cell biology and a member of the Daniel Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center, who is named as one of nine new Komen scholars. Uh, this group helps guide Komen research uh, in, in, to improve breast cancer outcome. Dr. Rosen is internationally recognized for his work in, in brand, breast cancer research. So lots of great science going on, uh, a lot of interesting things we'll be talking about. Anyway, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. Well, it's not afraid of thunder, she just did not like the rain. <laughs>